if we can imagine a great catastrophic events happening as recorded by mythology, then we can also imagine its impact on the consequent history of humanity on the planet. And we can begin to imagine that on some level, our own night terrors are descendant from that trauma. Your work, following up with Velikovsky and looking at the, the narratives we received from the earliest myths, is just at the core of my fascination here. I think it's remarkably viable that there actually is, in, in human history, a catastrophic experience. The stuff that uh, we can only begin to imagine in some of our most outrageous post-apocalyptic science fiction in the present day First of all, my more academic interest in mythology was really piqued by that because I felt like here is a way to look at myth that goes beyond the received or accepted uh, sort of psychosocial interpretation of mythology that we is there very commonly embraced today through the popularity of Joseph Campbell's work and Carl Jung, who have made very, very valid observations. But it seems that a lot of that interpretation of myth is founded on a ground of um, irrationality. That the, that the mind has somehow forged up some sort of strange, irrational, symbolic language with which to speak to itself. And that can only go so far in, in terms of making sense of what, what people were saying and what they meant. This goes beyond that. And this says uh, there may actually be a rational constant to these narratives that has something very important to not merely to tell us, but to remind us of. And it's interesting how uh, various different fields and different disciplines are rising to meet this idea. Our awareness, and it's just in the last decade, of the impact of trauma. Post-traumatic stress is now common vocabulary. It wasn't 10 years ago. We began to understand it in terms of the impact of war and a very extreme catastrophic experience on our veterans and, and, and how that manifests in their behavior. Um, we begin to recognize that the uh, victims of, say, 9-11 also manifest traumatic stress. And we can go back a generation or two and see how the victims of the Holocaust not only suffered post-traumatic stress, but also their children inherited it. And we can begin to see now epigenetic lines where stress goes from generation to generation. And so it becomes even easier to look back a few more generations, a few more generations, a few thousand years of generational trauma that uh, uh, connects all the way back to those early myths and brings them back into our modern discourse in a much more useful and uh, revelatory way. I think it was in the late 90s that I came across remembering the end of the world, and uh, that made a great impression on me. And it resonated on, on a number of different levels with my interest in storytelling, but it didn't have an immediate hookup with my work at the time. You know, I put that in the, the constellation of ideas that I was really interested in entertaining and exploring and that I might bring to my students because I've been teaching as an adjunct instructor of uh, storytelling up at East Tennessee State University for about 20 years now. And 9-11 uh, happens. I was looking at this repeated pattern of the separation of heaven and earth, because I sort of felt like the, this was this uh, dichotomy of forces, heaven and earth, you know, as, uh, which had it represented sort of abundance and austerity and just these different worldviews and clash with each other that I was witnessing happening in our current events. So I began to explore that, and and that led me uh, down a number of other different paths, including some of the interesting work uh, being done by Paul and Elizabeth Barber on how the mind creates myth, looking at myth from a sort of sociolinguistic perspective. Meanwhile, I came uh, to Thunderbolts of the Gods, 
And that, again, began to really bring back the remembering the end of the world, the work you were doing with that, and really connected a lot of dots for me and just just fascinated me. But it kept resonating with what I felt was troubling the world right now. So that got me onto the Thunderbolts website and the conference uh, videos that you had posted. And I thought, I need to get there. I want to get myself involved in that. And especially because it was interdisciplinary. Now, my own work in storytelling had been focusing in arts education, performing arts. Uh, and uh, the program that I teach in is very much based in uh, folklore, study of folklore. So this kind of work seemed a little marginal uh, to that, except that my growing concern with all of my students was not merely how well they could tell a story, uh, what they understood about the histories of storytelling, but that they had something important to say. That for me personally, the ramifications of all of this fascinating work, the, the interdisciplinary work of the Electric Universe has great significance for understanding the situation that we're in, in the present day in this world and the possibilities that lie before us. We live according to stories. And I mean, modern science is a narrative, essentially. Uh, it, it's simply one of the many narratives that we live by. And um, the shifting of those narratives seems to me at the root of what we need to address if we're going to effectively change our relationships to each other and our relationships to the world that we live in. Until we do, uh, no matter how much data we throw at each other, it just serves to uh, perpetuate a kind of uh, open-ended uh, separation and argument uh, rather than move towards uh, some kind of uh, harmonious progress. Mm -hmm.